The Chamber is really excited to host this conversation today about rebuilding lives and strengthening communities. And so to begin, I'd like to ask each of you to briefly tell us about yourself and your organizations. Dave Kravnacht, I'm the director of the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Uh, we're, we're kind of at the forefront of, obviously, from the incarceration issues in the state of North Dakota, and we're working hard to you know, try and reverse that a little bit to expand the whole idea of public safety. You know, what it, 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 it includes so much more than just incarcerating people and supervising them on probation to try and change it a little bit, change up the, the mindset about what a prison uh, is and what a prison should do. So excited to have the conversation today for sure. Uh, I'm Janelle Cheney, District Supervisor, Minnesota Parole and Probation, specifically with Clay County. I think that uh, we definitely have improved upon our approach and we continue to work on that, really focused on evidence-based practice, education, programming in lieu of incarceration, and definitely looking at what next, case planning, care planning, those kind of things. My name is Adam uh, Martin. I'm the CEO of FI Project. We do um, re-entry work, recovery reform for people coming out of jail or prison or treatment centers. Uh, we have seven transitional houses throughout North Dakota, and then I think probably over 600 participants across the state that we're currently working with monthly that are focused on employment, housing, recovery, and staying law-abiding. Uh, good morning. My name is Andrew Frobig. I am the jail administrator for the Cass County Sheriff's Office. i um, been serving in that role just shy of about 10 years now. Primarily, we're there to be the uh, initial point of, I guess, intervention when somebody first becomes justice involved, and then our role is to make sure they get to court and transition them into whatever their next step is going to be. Well, thank you all for each of your introductions. So to start us off, it's often said that the criminal justice system, behavioral health, and homelessness are cyclical. Can you briefly touch on the cyclical trend and highlight which aspects your organization is uniquely positioned to help address? Those services in our community, I think, that are becoming more and more in need when we look at the person, the persona of a person that comes to prison. You know, they're, Pam showed the numbers up there. They're struggling with, you know, addiction. They're struggling with mental health, and a lot of times they're housing is unstable and they've got a lot of other issues that have impacted them through their lives, whether it be trauma at young ages or trauma at older ages. So it just kind of seems to generate itself right now. And, and uh, you know, what we're looking at is at the DOCR is, is giving people those skills or, or those services where they can deal with addiction problems. We can address, you know, the stigma to it. We can also you know, help people with their education and also with, with understanding that, that I truly believe that everybody has value and everybody should have a voice and giving them that opportunity to know that they're seen and they're heard and they have something to contribute to the community, I think can go a long way when people transition out. Really connecting with providers in the community. I know agents will often try to support a client gaining residency, whether they're doing a letter of support for a landlord to read or walking through those steps with a client. You know, agents really struggle working on um, components that re reduce recidivism when their client is really focused on, I don't know where I'm eating tonight, I don't know where I'm sleeping, but yet you want to talk to me about this programming that was court ordered or, you know, what my release plan is. And so oftentimes that's really the first priority is making sure that that individual has a place to call home, feel safe, those kind of things. And so really educating landlords and um, agencies that can kind of support that. Um, there's trauma. Trauma is, uh, is not talked about a lot. And the reason that I think that trauma is like a very big deal is that you could take, you know, guy A and guy B and they're going through the system. They could have all the same resources and then you'll have different outcomes when they, when they, when they come out. It's not just the participant. It's the employers, right? It's the community, right? It's different systems. It's different courts. It's federal, it's state, it's, you know, child uh, services, right? Child enforcement. There's just so many different areas that a person is affected by when they walk out of prison that, uh, that sometimes I think that the, the community needs training. Now, I'd, I'd certainly say that, you know, the, the cyclical nature of things is, is apparent from the, the 
the turnover that you see with people coming back through the same, you know, same condition over and over and over again, coming back to jail, relapsing, that's certainly cyclical. But, but Adam's metaphor of the spider web is certainly much more accurate. You know, for, for the longest time we were focused on, in my career anyways, maybe trying to steer people towards things that were evidence-based programs. Well, this program is, say, 15% more effective than, than doing nothing or than doing this one, so we'll push everybody into that one program. And I think what we found is that it's far more individualized needs and having that comprehensive network and collaboration that we have with each other helps us target to the individual more than targeting the individual to a program. So with the increase in demand for behavioral health services, what advice does the panel have for employers to become that resource for those in need in the community? How can they tap in and use their resources to assist in that transition into, into the community? I think having that, that employer reach out to make sure that the health of their employees is important, you know, not only from the physical point of it, but also that mental piece. Be aware of those things. Be aware of what people are going through. Um, you know, and be supportive of that, whether it's an addiction problem, whether it's, you know, some issues at home, um, you know, trauma, all those things. I mean, people, people come with all of those issues, and I think one way that we can be more effective in, you know, in reducing the number of people that we incarcerate is just don't rely on incarceration to do, you know, those things of, of removing people from society, because, you know, we use this, the, stat, the statistic a lot here in, at the DOCR, you know, 95 to 97 percent of the people that we have incarcerated are going home within three years. Uh, they're going to be your neighbors. You know, we're trying to help them become better neighbors. And I think if the employers are aware of all of those issues that come with them and be supportive and understand the barriers that, that people in the criminal justice system face every day. So mental health is a big deal. And, and people, you know, you saw the numbers, right? Like it's getting, it's becoming a, a lot more relevant. And if you do not have a mental health wellness plan at your job, you're not going to make it very far. And so what I'm recommending that is if you're going to, if you're going to open up and be a little more diverse about your, your hiring practices, be ready to change some of your other practices. If you want people to do a good job, then you need to do a good job for them and they need to know that they're cared about. And they will overcome that, those mental health days and they will overcome stuff from their past. And we're seeing it have a ripple effect to the people that we serve. If you want uh, better employees, be a better leader. With Clay County uh, having just begun construction on a new withdrawal management and detox facility, can you articulate the importance of this facility and the opportunities that this expansion provides? They're going from a 16 bed to a 32 bed facility. Definitely there's a need. They will serve not only Clay County um, surrounding areas, um, I think law enforcement definitely will see this as a needed resource. I think it will impact our jails. Better options as to where people should land, how long they need those services and support. And then also I think the biggest component from my perspective working in field services is what, is, what does that look like when they're released? In the past, some kind of release to the streets and. Um, are back in that cycle that we talked about before, but um, with this new facility, they will release with a care plan. We can touch upon with the growing needs of mental health, how are your locations working to meet those needs to help with harm reduction and suicide? You know, workforce and mental health is very understaffed. How are you able to work collectively and together to help meet these needs? Um, you know, it's one of the things that I think we are now I don't think we are faced with uh, with the staffing shortages. Uh, we can't find people to come and work. Uh, we're modifying schedules in, in everything that we do. Um, so we're, we're trying to pay more attention to the health of not only um, our residents and people under supervision, but also of our team members that we have working for us. So, you know, finding those services and, and getting people to engage in those services has really been a challenge. Um, you know, I think we're kind of baby stepping into it, at least at the DLCR, to better understand what are the needs of residents. We have a pretty good idea. We've got programs established, but, you know, we have people going in and experiencing that secondary trauma or, you know, see things that are horrific working in our line of work here. Um, you know, to have that, 
that resource available where people can come and talk about those things or get the help that they need. More and more often what we're seeing is, you know, rather than people that have to be taken off the streets because they're a danger to society, more and more people being brought in because they're a danger to themselves. Now we have a really good track. There's a few things we're really good at. We have never lost a, a person to suicide in the history of our facility. We've never lost a person to an overdose. So we're good at keeping people alive. The problem is the jail is not at all a therapeutic environment to be maintaining that. We're a good intervention point and stabilization point, but the faster we can get people connected to a more therapeutic setting, the better. And right now we're really lacking in capacity in that area, statewide. Better people treat people better, right? And trauma is a gateway drug for all people, even people who didn't do drugs. I do want to thank Dave, Janelle, Adam, and Captain Frobig for your time and the great dialogue this morning. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.